I, you know, I, I first saw this documentary, I think maybe 20 years ago, some documentary by one of the science channels about how Yellowstone was actually one of the largest volcano or potential volcanoes on Earth and how it's blown up in the past. And if it blew up again, it could take out most of the United States. And it kind of spooked me, but, you know, I, life goes on. And now in the last couple of weeks, there have been a number of articles uh, about this floating around the Internet that uh, people are raising this once again as, uh, whoa, this, uh, you know, right in, the, right in the heart of America, this could be a problem. Uh, Dr. Larry Mastin is with us. He's a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, the David A. Johnson Cascades Volcano Ex- Observatory, the website uh, usgs.gov. Uh, Dr. Larry Mastin, welcome to the program. Thanks a lot, Tom. So tell us first about what is underneath Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is, um, as you mentioned, it's got a history of some of the largest eruptions on Earth. There have been three uh, what we call super eruptions, eruptions that have erupted more than about 1,000 cubic kilometers of ash and tephra. Um, There have been about three of those eruptions in the last 2.1 million years. The most recent was about 600,000 years ago. So these are not frequent events. The last one erupted long before any humans even lived on North America. And among the eruptions uh, in North America, they're they're about the least frequent uh, that we have. On the other hand, they're pretty interesting because they are so big. Mm -hmm. And and aren't they about every 600,000 years? And the last one was about 600,000 years ago? Or am I just way off? Yeah, but it's not really... um, it's not really periodic, mm. and there's been significant debate among the scientists as to whether Yellowstone will even produce another one of these eruptions. But it's it's still possible, and it's something that we um, think is worth talking about anyway. Right. So this is something worth researching and discussing, but not getting uh, not not getting out the uh, the ash fly tent to <laughs> pup tent or whatever. That's right. Uh, Part of the reason that we started this study was because so many people have asked us if there were another super eruption at Yellowstone, how much ash could I get if I lived in New York City or Chicago or Billings, Montana? And up to this point, we've had some information. We we can go, for example, to the north, to the Midwest and see deposits from past super eruptions, but those deposits have been removed and reworked by wind so much that the original thickness is not really apparent if you go to those locations. So we decided that it was worth it um, actually trying to develop a model to estimate how thick ash could be in those places. So it, it's taken a few years to do that. It's it's required developing a model that is uh, incorporates a a full three-dimensional wind field, the kind of wind field that is developed by NOAA for their weather prediction models. Uh, because it's an eruption that could cover the entire United States, we need a wind field that varies spatially and also temporally because uh, a an eruption could last for, say, a month. And so we, uh, we use the, uh, the NOAA wind fields in the model, but in addition to that, an eruption this big is fairly different from smaller sized eruptions in the sense that it can actually change the wind field. You're pumping so much ash into the air that it will rise buoyantly up to some elevation, and if it's if the volume you're adding is great enough, it'll actually drive ash upwind, sometimes over a thousand kilometers. Yeah. When I so go ahead, I'm sorry. So areas that would normally be unaffected by ash, especially in the Pacific Northwest, because we have a predominantly westerly wind field dr- driving uh, ash to the east. With the presence of this umbrella cloud that is produced during very large eruptions, we actually can push ash all the way to the west coast. And this agrees with some of the uh, the deposits we found. We found, for example, in the Klamath Basin, deposits from the eruption 2.1 million years ago, and also even offshore, off the coast of Oregon, there are some deep sea sea drill cores that have found ash from that uh, oldest eruption. So having this umbrella cloud in the model helps us explain this very widespread distribution of ash, including ash that seems to be upwind from the source. 
when I, I used to live in Portland, I lived there for about five years. And um, while I was living there, they discovered that part of downtown Portland, or not, not downtown, but part of, part of Portland, was on a hill that was actually an active volcano. And, and I guess it had been known for a while, but they, they said that Mount Hood, which is nearby, that everybody just thought was a mountain, is actually an active volcano that erupts every, I think it was 179,000 years, and it's overdue. Um, is there, or it might be overdue. I mean, it's debatable. <laughs> is there, is, is there any connection between all these things? I mean, if, if you saw a bunch of tectonic or, or excuse me, uh, volcanic activity in the Pacific Northwest, could that precipitate, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, Yellowstone, uh, uh, volcano or whatever you want to call this thing from blowing or vice versa? Well, I, I think it would be hard to say that an eruption in the Pacific Northwest might trigger something at Yellowstone, but there have been cases. Um, one example is Pinatubo that, uh, that occurred, l large eruptions that occurred not long after major earthquakes in the area. Hmm. And so there's been some suggestion that er large earthquakes can change the stress field in the earth and allow magma to rise through conduits or cracks that it could not have gotten through before the earthquake occurred. But right. everybody um, in the Pacific Northwest is waiting for the big earthquake now, too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and there were some interesting coincidences in time. The May 18, 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, for example, occurred uh, only a couple of weeks after four large earthquakes in the Mammoth Lakes area in California, which is also a volcanic region. But I think for things that, that are that far apart spatially, people assume that they are mostly just coincidental. Right. Okay. So this, is, this should be uh, in the area of scientific curiosity rather than, uh, for example, uh, uh, I don't, what's the equivalent of public health? Public safety, I guess? Yeah. Well, there are, there are, of course, we in the U.S. Geological Survey, we deal, uh, we work very closely with emergency managers from counties and uh, states that have active volcanoes. And we have um, certainly talked with emergency managers and land managers in the Rocky Mountain states. But the most common sorts of hazards at Yellowstone, for example, are small hydrothermal explosions that have happened several times in the last few decades. Mm. The most recent magmatic uh, eruption in Yellowstone was about 70,000 years ago that produced a large lava flow. But you have to go back 600,000 years to find a super eruption. And so it's, it's fairly low on the list of concerns that people have or something that could realistically occur but it's pretty high on the list of things that are that are interesting because of their size yeah it's fascinating science i mean it, this would be if it blew one of the largest volcanoes on the planet yeah yeah it, there are a few other cases there's a um in indonesia 75,000 years ago a uh, toba volcano erupted and produced um an eruption that was comparable in size to the yellowstone eruptions yeah and there are other places around the world. Uh, the estimate is that somewhere around the world, there is a super eruption about every 100,000 years. Hmm. But wow. um, Yellowstone has had more than its share of these super eruptions. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Dr. Larry Mastin, the hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, usgs.gov is the website, uh, and the uh, David A. Johnson Cascade Volcano Observatory, uh, Observatory. Thank you, sir, for dropping by today. Thanks a lot. Great talking with you, and, and thank you for the information.